Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I have as my guest Dr. Carter Beck. Dr. Beck is a neurosurgeon. He did his medical school training at the University of Chicago School of Medicine. From there, he completed a neurosurgical residency at Stanford University. Good morning, Dr. Beck. Good morning, Dr. Seacrest. Well, thanks for joining us. Today, I thought what we would discuss is really a general concept of the neurosurgical approach to back pain. And really what I'm talking about is I really want to discuss how neurosurgeons view and approach the, the, the epidemic of back pain and how you as a neurosurgeon tend to uh, evaluate patients and then proceed with a treatment plan. How does that sound? That sounds like a big topic, uh, but I'm happy to, to do so. It's an important topic, and as you alluded to, back pain affects a very large uh, percentage of the population at some point in their life, upwards of two-thirds of, of people will at some point in their life have back pain. Um, let's talk a little bit about the disease of back pain. Um, my understanding and my experience uh, uh, as an orthopedic surgeon is that there is still an epidemic of low back pain in this country. Um, wh why? Well, there's, that's a complicated question. I think there's uh, many factors which contribute to a, a, a human being ultimately developing back pain. One of them is, is simply an evolutionary a result of the fact that we have upright posture mm -hmm. and uh, the stresses, the mechanical stresses on the low back from the fact that we, we stand upright and, and walk around uh, are significant. We also live uh, uh, much longer um, than um, per, perhaps we, uh, at earlier points in history and that uh, means that this, this mechanical device, the, the lumbar spine, is going to have to uh, put up with a lot of wear and tear over a prolonged period of time. The uh, other features of uh, genetics uh, or, or heredity may, may impact on, on which uh, uh, patient develops back pain and when they do in their life and how severe it is and what the cause is. Mm -hmm. um, it, there, certainly there is a, um, a genetic contribution to uh, degeneration or deterioration in the lumbar spine. Lifestyle issues, uh, smoking, uh, we know it is, is quite hard on the joints and then on the lumbar spine, causes a premature deterioration in, in the spine. Uh, uh, obesity, uh, eating too much. Um, um, poor physical condition, lack of muscle tone, lack of, uh, of strength in the abdominal girdle from a desk job, say, um, or, or being a piano teacher uh, could, could, uh, could definitely contribute. So it's, it's a whole gamut of things that ultimately uh, will result one way or another in a patient getting back pain. And of course there's trauma and injury. Sometimes you just twist wrong and pull a muscle. Mm -hmm. um, other times um, it's, it's an amalgam of things that have developed over years. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned that even having a desk job in some ways is a risk factor for developing low back pain because I think a lot of patients that come in, they're always looking for that cause, how they injured their back. And in most cases of low back pain, it's not necessarily an injury. And, and we tend to think that uh, the laboring population, the people that are bending, twisting, lifting, are at more risk of developing back pain. And what you just alluded to is the fact that even people with desk jobs have, have risk that they may very well develop back pain and just having a nice easy job is not a protection against developing back pain. I think that's absolutely true. One of my observations uh, over time in my career is that is that people who have low intensity physical demands that continuous throughout the day mm -hmm. um, probably have the healthiest spines, custodial workers for example, people who are, are doing some physical activity moving in, in multiple ways without high strain. Um, um, but, but changing positions and um, doing basic healthy, uh, ac healthy physical activity all day long, they, they tend to, uh, their spines tend to age pretty well, whereas somebody who is either very sedentary or uh, on the other end of the extreme, um, uh, very active, say a roofer, those people are, are more prone to developing a problem with their back. You know, I, I totally agree with that, and I think I would put it a little different. I've come to believe that, it, it, that the critical issue is that people who have control over their ergonomics, and what, what, I say, what I mean by that is that people that can move around in different postures, they're active throughout the day, and it's not a static posture. 
So people on an assembly line, for example, they're active, but it's in a static way. It's a repetitive way that the same forces are hitting the spine time after time after time. Same thing goes for sitting. If you're sitting all day, it's that same static posture. The people that you just alluded to, the people that um, I would say probably go back to our days as hunter, hunting and gatherers uh, who can move around and sort of do their own thing, and, and when they get in a bad position, they can move and do something different. They tend to age very well. Yeah, I, I think so. It's an interesting observation. Yeah, it's there. probably a lesson for all of us to it, sort it, of think about. Right, right. Well, the other piece that people are always interested in is the notion of, of what's causing my back pain. Now, again, my, my record or my uh, approach to this is that in the vast majority of cases, when back pain starts, we really don't know what's, what's causing your pain. We don't know the structure that is responsible for causing the pain, what we sometimes term the pain generator. And trying to track that down and, and decide what structure is, is causing your pain, is a, it can be a long and tedious process. Give us a little bit of a rundown from a neurosurgical standpoint. What, what neurosurgeons think about the causes of back pain, the source of back pain, and how you try to uh, fit that concept into your thought processes as you're evaluating a patient? Well, it, I think you've alluded to what is really, I think, the most important element of, of my uh, role as a, as a spine physician, and that is making some correlation between the symptoms of patient experiences and what we can uh, discover from an MRI scan, a CAT scan, a set of x-rays, or any of the other uh, diagnostic tools that we have at our disposal. Um, I, I always tell patients I could I could pick anyone off the street today, put them in an MRI scanner, and find something that is uh, abnormal in in their spine. Does that mean that's symptomatic and requires surgery? Usually not. In fact, the patient, uh, the person walking down the street who I asked to have an MRI scan may not have any symptoms at all, even though we find multiple things on an MRI scan. So. Uh, by that, uh, by that logic, if you, if you have somebody come in the office and they say, my back hurts and my back hurts when, when I sit, or my back hurts when I stand, or my back hurts while I'm at my, at my workplace, um, just because there's something abnormal on their scan doesn't mean, uh, on an MRI scan, doesn't mean that that's the cause of, uh, of the pain. And, um, and so that correlation is very important. Uh, the way to do that is, is by, uh, I think, the, a very, very traditional, organized, and disciplined approach to clinical medicine. And that is to take a careful history and listen to the patient, listen to what they're complaining about, listen to how it started, what the chronology is. Has it been bothering them for years? Has it just been bothering them for two days? Did it come on after a minor accident? That people often tell me about tripping on their, on their small dogs or, um, or a little stumble on the ice. Um, so basic, uh, uh, basically careful history is important, a, a careful physical exam is important. Um, figuring out where it hurts, touching it, palpating it, um, examining the, neuro the nervous system and finding out if any uh, spinal nerves are, aren't functioning properly. And then, uh, and then a, a battery sometimes of, of confirmatory tests. And a 25-year-old who, who strained their back uh, lifting something very heavy, perhaps all that's necessary is a set of x-rays. Mm -hmm. In uh, somebody who's had repeated episodes of back pain that may be associated with leg pain or numbness in the leg, sciatica, something that suggests that, that a nerve is involved, then often an MRI scan uh, uh, is indicated. And we can go from there. There, there. there are three or four other tests that, that are often uh, uh, needed in order to develop a really clear picture of, of, the, of the whole patient and what is, uh, what is going on. You know, it's interesting that, that you've gone back to the basics of medicine. And I think it is so critical in this day and age when we think that everything is about technology. And patients come in every day and just almost demand an MRI scan to tell them what's wrong with their back. And that whole thought process of somehow an MRI scan can tell you what is causing the back pain is the first error that, that, that a lot of physicians make, I think, and I think a, a lot of patients make. And the importance of listening, 
of understanding the natural history of low back pain and then understanding um, how to evaluate a patient physically to really try to get a feel for um, what's the possible causes. And as you said, you used a, a key term and I think that, that everybody should understand this. The tests are then confirmatory. You know, the, the old adage is that 85% of diagnosis is made on the history. And everything beyond that is trying to confirm our thought process as we go down the path of trying to say, are the tests, is the research I'm doing, the MRI scan and that sort of stuff, is that confirming my hypothesis of what's wrong with this patient? Yeah, I completely agree. As I said, a lot of patients who come to my office have had an MRI scan. Mm -hmm. And when I ask them what's happening, what's bothering them, what brings them into my office today, they tell me, well, you've seen, they tell me that there's something on their MRI scan. And as far as they're concerned, that's the diagnosis and that's the end of the discussion. Then what are we going to do about what we found on the MRI scan? Mm -hmm. And so I usually have to rewind quite a bit at that point and say, I, ha I haven't looked at your MRI scan. I have a habit, a personal habit, of not looking at a patient's films until I've taken the history. Because as you say, that's 85% of it. And, and it doesn't really matter what the MRI scan shows. I, I need to be developing a diagnosis based on talking to the patient. And then we look at the MRI scan and find where, where the consistencies are, where the inconsistencies are. And I, I, I do that as a, as a rule. Uh, and I think it leads to a better patient care. I, I think you're absolutely correct. I think that it's so easy to get biased by either other people's impressions that, that sort of poison your own ability to to view things from a clean slate. And then especially if you've seen that, that uh, abnormality on some sort of imaging test, you tend to do things that, that confirm that rather than the other way around. And it's, it, it is definitely a trap. You know, uh, family, friends of family, uh, people often call me and, and, and ask for an informal consultation. They say, well, you t take a look at my MRI scan. And I say, Sir, sure, I'll take a look at your MRI scan, but that doesn't help me. I, I need to I need to talk to the patient. And if it's uh, Joe's uncle's brother's best friend, um, Joe's uncle's brother's best friend needs to come see me because I, I really I really can't do uh, any a patient a service just by looking at an MRI scan. Agreed. Um, let's go back a little bit about the the actual physical exam. As a neurosurgeon, what are the things that you're evaluating when you actually begin laying hands on a patient after the history? What sort of things are you going to do with that patient in the examining room, and what are you looking for? Well, the physical exam starts when I go and greet a patient in the waiting room. I, I watch them stand up. I watch them walk into my office. I watch how they sit while we, while we take the history, and I'm really beginning the physical exam at that point uh, because I'm looking for signs. Uh, there's, we talk about the distinction between signs and symptoms. Symptoms are what the patient says is bothering them. Signs are, are what you can objectively observe. And so that's uh, really part of the physical exam. Uh, patients who are, are sitting intolerant, that will give me uh, some uh, indication as to what might be going on in their back versus somebody who's standing intolerant. Um, very classically, patients with a big herniated disc will come in my office and they'll stand to, while we take the history. And I consider that really a, a physical finding, a sign. Um, when I bring them back to the exam room and, uh, and start re really laying on the hands, um, we're, we're going to go through a bunch of basic things, take their blood pressure. Um, to uh, listen to the heart and the chest because some systemic disorders, to general medical illness, can result in back pain. Or patients uh, um, need to be healthy uh, otherwise for me to get a clear diagnosis of, uh, of what's going on with their back. Then we go into uh, basic uh, uh, examination of the spine. Can, can they uh, bend their leg? Can they uh, extend their leg straight in a sitting position? Is there muscle spasm in uh, and around the lumbar spine and the paraspinal muscles? And then, of course, a, a thorough neurological exam. As a neurosurgeon, I'm probably a little bit more focused on, on that, but I think all spine surgeons, uh, from whatever uh, their uh, training tradition, focus a lot on the on the nervous system because the spine is intimately associated with with the nerves, and uh, we're going to look at. Uh, at how the, the nerves function. And to do that, we look at the basic functions of the nerves. Is there sensitivity to touch, to pressure, to pain? Uh, we use a little sharp wheel that will uh, simulate a pin prick. 
And then uh, basic muscle function, nerve, spinal nerves go to predictable muscle groups. And if you have an L5, S1 herniated disc and, and pressure on the S1 nerve, uh, there, there will be uh, typical signs. Or, or if you have an L4, 5 herniated disc, uh, patients often have a foot drop. And there, so we look for the clinical patterns on the physical exam from the a knowledge of the anatomy of the structure and function of nerves and muscle groups. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think um, both orthopedic spine surgeons as well as neurosurgeons do tend to focus on what we would consider signs and symptoms that uh, the nervous system is involved. And I've, I've, over the years, I've found that sometimes physical therapists and other types of providers who focus much more on the mechanical aspects, the, 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 the pattern of posture, the pattern of gait, the pattern of muscle recruitment, and those sorts of things, which I don't think we know a lot about, are very good at trying to look at those other components of the, of the back, you know, the muscle and the way the back moves and that sort of stuff. And I do think that we as spine surgeons tend to uh, get a little too focused sometimes on the nervous system. And, and the problem with that is, is that if we don't find anything wrong with the nervous system and we tell the patient that's okay, they sort of assume that everything's okay. And that's not the case. I mean, so much, so much of back pain is really mechanical pain in the spine rather than problems with the nervous system. And that probably gives people more trouble than the numbers of patients or the percentage of patients that we see who actually have nerve problems that may need surgery or something like that. Yeah, I think it's a minority of patients who actually come to spine surgery who have a, an observable neurological deficit on their exam. Some people have neurological symptoms, say numbness or pain uh, in a, in going down the leg, the back of the leg, sciatica, but they may have a normal neurological exam. I think one of the reasons spine surgeons focus on that is because when the nervous system gets involved and when there, there become objective uh, neurological deficits, we know at that point for certain that the patient is likely reaching a point where it's not going to get better by itself. This is not a, a short-term episode and, and surgery is obviously more likely to be uh, the right choice. And so we, we have a, a quick and easy uh, screening uh, in the uh, physical exam is uh, to how severe uh, a problem may be and, and, and whether or not uh, we need to proceed with, to, with surgery and, a, and at what uh, sort of urgency. If a patient comes in and they have a foot drop, their, their foot is, is flapping on the, on the street when they walk down the street because the L5 nerve root isn't functioning. That's, a, that's an indication to do early surgery and probably tomorrow or the next day, uh, not something that we would like to wait around on for weeks and weeks because we worry that there's permanent neurological damage occurring and that is, of course, um, uh, frequently not recoverable. Hmm. I think we, we should for the audience. I really want people to understand the difference between what we would consider in some cases, let's say mechanical nonspecific low back pain. Or, or non-specific low back pain, and the difference between that, in our minds, and neurological or neurogenic back pain. So I guess in general, separate those two for me. Separate non-specific low back pain, how you think about that, and the neurogenic back pain. I think you just did to a great degree, but I really want it clarified. Uh, one of the most common diagnoses made in an emergency room is a lumbar strain. And we talk about how many patients have some kind of significant back pain during the course of their life. The majority of those, we're talking about a lumbar strain, which is a sort of a one-time event. They pulled a muscle, they, they bent wrong, um, they fell down, and, and they've got some soreness in their back. That's a self-limited process that doesn't necessarily have any uh, anatomically identifiable uh, uh, correlate. So you get an MRI scan and it's normal. Um, those patients, they have spasm in their back, they have limitation in their range of motion, uh, they have uh, a pain which is interfering with their ability to, uh, to sometimes even get out of bed. It can, be, it can be very significant. But it's the first time it's happened, it's only been going on for two days, and uh, the majority of those will get better by themselves and don't even require an MRI scan. Um, when we talk about just back pain without any neurological um, uh, correlate, 
to start getting into talking about doing sophisticated testing, to get into talking about sending the patient to a neurosurgeon or, or, or another or an orthopedic spine surgeon, uh, we have to have a, a, a longer term. So I think the time course is, uh, is important. Something that's been bothering a patient for three to six months is getting into a region where we're saying maybe this isn't just a muscle strain, it isn't just a soft tissue problem and that there's something mechanical occurring. Um, positional aspects um, of, of the pain, a pain which it comes on only when a patient stands or only when a patient sits and is relieved by changing position, that suggests that there's a mechanical problem with the structure and function of the lumbar spine and so that, that can be important too. Um, a pulled muscle tends to hurt all day and, and, and be independent of, of position. Now, a couple, I'm going to put you on the spot here because I think there's always been this controversy in terms of the notion of a lumbar strain. And lots of people leave a practitioner's office with that diagnosis of a lumbar strain. What do you think is hurting in that case? I mean, what do you think is actually causing the pain when we diagnose a lumbar strain? Well, I, I think it is uh, an amalgam of things. I think that, um, that there, it's relatively minor um, uh, injuries to, to perhaps multiple structures. Um, and the, I think the most important uh, criterion for a lumbar strain is that, one, we don't know, in fact, what's causing it. We can speculate, but we don't know because there is no there is no structural correlate on an MRI scan, and it gets better by itself. Mm -hmm. So not only do we not know, but it really doesn't matter because it's going to go away by itself. There are a lot of people who are diagnosed with lumbar strain, and it's incorrect. Really what they have is a torn or herniated lumbar disc, and in the course of time, we figure that out. Um, if I had to guess, I, I would say that um, of the thousands of muscles, which are very small muscles interacting with, with various points on the lumbar vertebra, that a, a real, honest to goodness, lumbar strain is a pulled muscle. Mm. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. You made a couple of comments that I want to really clarify, and that is part of the problem is patients, you know, patients want an answer. And it's so difficult sometimes to, to have them be satisfied with the answer that, you know, here's what I can tell you. You have back pain, nonspecific low back pain. Maybe it's a lumbar strain. We've looked at everything. We don't see anything dangerous going on. And it, it doesn't matter to us at this point what, what's causing your pain because we're going to treat this empirically, basically based on our experience that most people get better and the worst thing we could do is do a bunch of tests now and start putting you in a medical model. And patients, th that somehow is, is uh, counterintuitive to them. They, they really get concerned when you tell them you don't know and they hear that and they're not hearing the real message which is, look, this is probably a self-limited problem that's going to go away on its own. So let's watch it for a little while. Yeah, pain is, is powerfully motivating for patients, and, and back pain can be severe and it can be incapacitating. And, uh, and I agree, there's a disconnect between uh, what a spine surgeon or a, sp or a spine doctor understands about back pain, and that is the most important thing we can do is be patient because a lot of patients will get better by themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and a patient who is re feeling really uncomfortable and is, is maybe is 32 and has never had a real medical issue in their life, they want an answer. And, um, and so education becomes a very a critical part of being a good spine physician is, is to be able to sit back and, and tell a patient, I know it bothers you, but what, one of the most important things we can do here is not get too jumpy, not get too reactive, and give it some time. Mm -hmm. Now, you had mentioned that, that one of the reasons to, to see a neurosurgeon and maybe take this nonspecific low back pain a little bit more serious is the fact that it's persistent and it's not going away, or it's continuing to recur, and it's the same thing every time, or maybe a little different every time, but the bottom line is it's not, you're not getting back to normal, and you're not living a normal lifestyle, and it's gone on for a period of time, and although there's no nerve signs or symptoms, maybe it's something that can be corrected by some type of an intervention, surgery or injections or something like that. Now let's move to the neurogenic or the, the neurological problems. You've alluded also earlier to the notion that if, if nerves aren't functioning, if we're, we've got, we see a patient with a foot drop uh, or weakness, what are some of the other things that you would caution patients that if this is occurring, 
in the face of back pain or, or maybe not in any back pain, you need to begin to think about seeing a neurosurgeon and have this evaluated? Well, it, it, that is, um, is a broad topic. Um, there, there are a lot of nerves that are coming uh, through and out of the lumbar spine. Um, um, I think uh, one of the things you're alluding to there is bowel and bladder function. Um, and the, the cauda equina is, um, is the collection of nerves that go through the lumbar spine. And, and in that collection of nerves are the nerves that go to, uh, to your bowel and bladder and control uh, continence. And um, in very bad disc herniations and very bad disorders of the lumbar spine, uh, continence can be affected. And um, a, a deficit in, uh, in the bowel or bladder bladder function, numbness in the, in the private area is one of the scariest things for a uh, spine surgeon uh, to see. There are a lot of patients who have pain and have a little bit of a urinary urgency uh, that, that we don't worry about too much. Um, but um, but a, a real problem with the bowel and bladder is, is probably the, the, the biggest and scariest thing um, that we see with lumbar spinal disorders. It is extremely rare. Uh, I, I can count on one hand, I think, in the course of my career, the number of patients who, who really had bowel and bladder dysfunction as a result of, uh, of a problem in the lumbar spine. Um, other, uh, other nerves that, that exit in the lumbar spine or, go, or pass through the lumbar spine are nerves that go to the legs and, um, and to some extent, the, the hip region. And, um, and real focal weakness in any of those muscle groups um, is an issue. Um, so the classic example being the foot drop. If you can't raise your big toe off the, off the ground uh, and you're having pain that goes down uh, the leg, sciatica, down the back of the leg, and, and maybe back pain, maybe not, um, that's an issue. Um, and we, we were concerned at that point that there's enough pressure on the nerve that the nerve is being damaged uh, and, and maybe in a permanent way. That goes also with the muscles of the, of the quadriceps, um, muscles that go to the calf and to the foot extensors. Those uh, muscle groups are more complicated to examine um, and usually a patient's perception of weakness um, in that case is more accurate than a physician's because th there are multiple muscle groups with multiple nerves uh, in each of those muscle groups. Um, numbness, which is intermittent, uh, is less concerning than numbness, which comes on and stays uh, and stays present 24 hours a day. Um, at that point, we, we also think that that's an indication that there may be some permanent uh, damage occurring to a nerve. Mm -hmm. um, pain that goes into the leg but stops above the knee, sort of buttock and, and hamstring pain, is frequently isn't isn't neurologic at all. It, it's related to muscle spasm, and it can be easily confused with sciatica. But uh, pain, which, uh, which is, uh, stays above the knee on the back side of the leg, is something that is uh, pretty much normal, even just with a lumbar strain, which is going to get better by itself. Mm -hmm. So if I can paraphrase, I, I, think, I think you and I probably think alike. There's one emergency, one true emergency, that you don't even make a choice. And that's if you feel like that you've lost sensation in your crotch area, what we call saddle anesthesia. That's an emergency, and especially if it's combined with, with inability to, to hold your bowels or your bladder. You're leaking, you don't know you have to go, whatever. That's, that's a true emergency. Rare, but a true emergency. I think the second thing you said was, was if you're having progressive weakness, weakness that's getting worse every day, or just weakness that came is not getting better pretty quick, and numbness that's come and it's getting worse by the day or it's not getting any better, that's a relative emergency that you might want to start thinking about calling a neurosurgeon and, and having it checked out. Certainly, I agree. If um, any time you have progressive weakness, uh, a part of the body isn't working, mm -hmm. um, probably should be uh, examined. You know, it's, 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 the question always comes up, and, and I'm not certain ever how to answer this question, but the question always comes up amongst patients if they have a neurological uh, compression, so let's say they've, they've had numbness for two weeks, they've had a little bit of weakness for two weeks, the question always comes up, how long can I watch that before I begin to do permanent damage if I don't have a surgical intervention? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's a continuum. I think a, a little bit of weakness uh, for a short time in, in any muscle group 
uh, has a very low risk of a permanent damage. Um, I think a, a lot of weakness for a long time has a high risk. And, um, and so I always tell patients the longer uh, a muscle group is weak and the worse the weakness is, the, the, the lower our chances. Um, there are some patients who will herniate a disc and have some weakness and it'll go away by itself before they ever get to see the doctor. Um, so it, it's not, there's no, there aren't absolutes, but I, I think uh, all we have to uh, can do is, is look at statistics and, um, and think about it logically, and that is the more pressure on a nerve and the, the worse the dysfunction, the more chance that it's permanent. Mm -hmm. Now what about the same for mechanical back pain, for people who are having problems with um, maybe some instability in the spine or, or what we would consider maybe subclinical instability of the spine where the, the, the disc and the, uh, the joints in the spinal segment are degenerated and that, that, that excess motion through that segment that's degenerated is causing pain. Are there any downsides to putting that off as long as you possibly can before you consider a surgical approach to that disease? I, I think that's the exception. I think it's unusual that we've really lost much. Um, whereas if you don't diagnose cancer, it, it can run away from you. Mm -hmm. Back pain, usually not. I think that uh, a danger of chronic back pain that is uh, underappreciated in the general medical community and, and with patients is the effect it has on a patient's psychology, uh, uh, on their lifestyle. Um, patients who have chronic pain get depressed, they can get uh, addicted to narcotic medications, they uh, can start having dysfunction uh, or, or failure to perform in their job, in their marriage, um, and those uh, sort of things start to snowball w with chronic pain of any sort, particularly back pain, and, um, and that is a real danger. And so um, um, I think it's important to, to say if you have back pain, to what level is it, is it interfering with your overall lifestyle and your performance in life, your enjoyment of life? Are you getting depressed? Have you been taking narcotic uh, medicines uh, uh, for weeks on end? And that's a, that's a real danger, and that's when, uh, when I start to get concerned. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting for a neurosurgeon to say that because I think that, that the, the traditional approach has been sort of um, a, a very stoic approach with the medical community in general. And surgeons are probably uh, less likely to recognize the psychological impact of these diseases and how, what that does long term. You know, we're, we're always focused on the notion that if that nerve is pinched, then you're going to lose the ability to raise your foot, and that's, that's bad, and we need to stop that. We're not as focused on if you have that amount of back pain and you let this go on, you know, you run the risk of divorce, you run the risk of, of losing your job, you run the risk of, of becoming addicted and essentially spiraling down to the point where you're non-functional. And it's all a psychological side effect of that first chronic pain or that first episode that then spirals into chronic pain. And I guess what you're saying is that that needs to be taken into consideration. And when you make a decision as to whether or not to let this condition go on and on and on, um, there are some ramifications there. There's some side effects. I agree. I, I think the most common complication, serious permanent or semi-permanent complication of a disorder in the lumbar spine is a personal psychological effect. Um, uh, I think the, the nerve that's broken is, is a much less frequent problem. Mm -hmm. um, any, any suggestions other than surgery about how to deal with, with that situation where, where you've now got a situation that the patient is in chronic unremitting pain and it doesn't have a surgical solution? Any suggestions from the neurosurgical side what, what we as physicians should be focusing on to try to manage that situation? I think it's important for a patient that has a real back problem, a chronic back problem, whether or not it's ultimately is a surgical issue, to, to have professional help. Uh, backs are very complicated and it, it requires the interaction and the cooperation of multiple specialists to care for a patient with a back problem. Um, and um, I think that sometimes that that is underestimated um, and uh, people get sort of a quick and dirty uh, cure in, the, in a bottle 
and, and it's viewed that that's the extent of the treatment which is necessary. Uh, taking pills are one part of, of caring for a patient with a chronic back problem, um, but it, it is only one part. And I think that really what patients need is to be in multidisciplinary care where they have access to, to psychiatric care, to physical therapists, to uh, injection therapies. Um, the pain physicians are an increasingly important part of caring for patients with backs. Um, people ha should have access to alternative uh, medicine, such as chiropractic or acupuncture. There's a significant uh, number of patients who have uh, back pain, back problems for years, that their primary treatment is chiropractic. Mm -hmm. And I think it's valid um, and needs, uh, needs to be part of the armamentarium. Um, any other areas of the neurosurgical approach to low back pain that we have not covered during this discussion that, that you would like to, to, to have people know about, either primary care providers, other providers of, of spine care, or patients? Well, I, I think the point that we're just discussing is probably the most important, and, and that is uh, uh, a Apart from a lumbar strain, something that goes on for a week or, or two at the most, um, patients with chronic back pain need help. And, um, and one of the primary things that uh, we as physicians can do for patients is help educate them as to how to manage something which may not need any direct or interventional uh, treatment. And so um, uh, patients in pain need help and they, they need to be cared for and they need to be cared for in a timely fashion. And I think that if, if we as a community of physicians and as a community at large uh, recognize that and, and, um, and deal with it uh, in an upfront manner that we, we can reduce the scope of this problem in America. Mm -hmm. I agree. You know, I think it's, it goes back to that disease management uh, sort of paradigm in the sense that, that if we treated diabetes, and, and, and in the past we did, I mean, the type 2 diabetes, the, uh, the, the, the type that occurs older in, in older folks, if we approached it just sort of saying, you know, your blood sugar is too high, um, you need to do something about that, and said, there's nothing I can do about it. Um, if we did that, we would have an epidemic, which, which we did for a while. And now people are taking a very proactive uh, stance to some of these disease processes to really try to manage them well, as you've said. We still don't do that with low back pain. We basically tell people, you've got low back pain, you need to deal with it. We don't offer them any, any ways, strategies. We don't offer them any sort of... Uh, um, approach to that or help with that in a large number of cases. Um, so I think we're seeing the results of that, of this epidemic of people who feel that they've been disabled by this condition and there's nothing they can do about it and they're just left to sort of wander through the system. I agree, it's funny you say that. I often tell patients back pain can be a lot like diabetes, more like diabetes than appendicitis. You have to manage it, and sometimes the answer with diabetes is a pill, sometimes it's diet modification, sometimes it's injections, sometimes it's a, it's a varying uh, 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 mixture of all three, and, uh, and, and back pain is like that. Sometimes you need surgery, sometimes you need uh, a, a good counselor, sometimes you need an injection, um, and it really takes a sophisticated uh, back spine care professional to help you uh, help a patient through that, that maze. You know one thing that I would like for patients to know is that for years I see patients in my office who come in and have they been to uh, a specialist, a, a neurosurgeon, an orthopedic spine surgeon, someone who they've left that office basically saying um, the surgeon has told them that this may not be a surgical lesion. The surgeon may have said I cannot help you they take that to mean there's no help for them. And I think the one thing that they need to understand is that what the surgeon is saying is, I'm not the right person to help you. And you need to seek out someone that, that can help you manage your, your, your pain. And obviously in communities where that, uh, that capability is present, it's, it's easier and people are aware of that. But I would like for patients to understand that you shouldn't stop there. When, when a surgeon or someone says, I can't help you, that doesn't necessarily mean there's nothing to be done. It means that you're in the wrong place. You're not in the right place at the right time. 
and you may need to be at a, at a different place. Right, I, I would take that even a step further and say there's, there's many patients who are referred to a surgeon, say first or second mm -hmm. on their list, and they may ultimately require surgery, but now is not the time. And so the, there are many patients who um, I'll send off uh, to have an injection or to have uh, some other multidisciplinary sort of approach to their pain, knowing that they may well end up having surgery. But it's, it, to have a good outcome uh, in spine care, it must, be, it must be the right treatment at the right time for the right reason on the right patient. I think that's excellent advice. I don't think I could say it any better. That's, that's a very good uh, sort of tagline uh, as we close. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you.